So today is the ninth Sunday after Pentecost. We'll be here again in Kentucky. In the epistle for this ninth Sunday after Pentecost, it's taken from St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 10. Brethren, these things came to pass as examples to us, that we should not lust after evil things even as they lusted, and do not become idolaters even as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication even as some of them committed fornication. And there fell in one day 23,000. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them tempted and perished by the serpents. Neither murmur, as some of them murmured, and perished at the hands of the destroyer. All, things happened, all these things happened to them as a type, and they were written for our correction, upon whom the final age of the world has come. Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. May no temptation take hold of you, but such as a man is equal to. God is faithful and will not permit you to be tempted beyond your strength. But with the temptation will also give you a way out that you may be able to bear it. And in the gospel, turn the court to St. Luke, chapter 19. At that time when Jesus drew near to Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, If thou hast known in this thy day, even thou, the things that are for thy peace, but now they are hidden from thy eyes, for the days will come upon thee when thy enemies will throw that up a rampart about thee, and surround thee and shut thee in on every side. <clears throat> when there, and will dash thee to the ground and thy children within thee, and will not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou hast not known the time of thy visitation. And they entered the temple and began to cast out those who were selling and buying in, the in, in it, saying to them, It is written, My house is a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And he was teaching daily in the temple. Thus are the words of today's Holy Gospel. Mm -hmm. Father, the Holy Ghost to men. So today a few considerations <clears throat> on the modernistic and Masonic <clears throat> response of Father Pagliarani, the superior of the Society of St. Pius X, to the motu proprio of Pope Francis of July the 16th, uh, in 2021, Traditionis Custodis. It's now a week and a few days since that motu proprio was made, and already throughout the world there have been many, many Latin masses shut down. Many priests are trembling in fear and don't know what to do. The motu proprio was not a shock, nor was it the great crime of Pope Francis. The motu proprio was put into practice, the will of John Paul II, in 1984. When he noted, when he first made that first motu proprio on October 22, 1984, he said that this indult of allowance of the older form of liturgy is being done because people are leaving the church and see the mass as divisive. So they must understand that we will try to help them to have their Latin mass but in order to bring them back into the true fold of Vatican II. And therefore, the conditions of receiving this indult, which is an allowance of something that is against the law, in order to prevent a greater evil. The reason for this indult is to allow people to come to the Latin Mass so that they might see inside of the Novus Ordo Church how the new Mass and old Mass are quite compatible and go well one with each other. And this Latin Mass should not be allowed in parochial churches, this Latin Mass should not be allowed for weddings or for funerals. It should not be allowed for any events such as confirmations or baptisms surrounding those type of events. And should be known as, as, as an only tolerated form of the Mass to help those people that are overly attached to the old Mass to come back to the new. And that was the will of Pope John Paul II, whom they call Saint. And John Paul II who under, who, under whose reign there was the greatest exodus from the Catholic faith in the last 2,000 years. John Paul II, who said that God came to reveal man to man, and who did only tolerate the Latin Mass, 
but did not at all want it to be part of the, of the, of the new church that came out of Vatican II. That was his will in 84. It was repeated again in 88. 1988, uh, uh, Archbishop Lefebvre did an act to save the Catholic priesthood, to save the Latin Mass, and that act was to consecrate four bishops, four bishops who would form priests and who would ordain priests that are not modernists and who would be independent from the dioceses so that they could operate freely, following the model of Cluny in France in 810 A.D., the model of the Benedictines, who operated independent monasteries without being controlled by the bishops who were corrupted and ruled by the kings, and through these independent monasteries, not ruled by the local bishops, not corrupted by local bishops, they were able to build Christendom against the local bishops who were very corrupt. And following the model of Cluny, the, 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 the Archbishop Lefebvre <clears throat> ordained these priests, consecrated these bishops to ordain priests who would be beacons of faith and truth throughout the world. And not only did priests join the Society of St. Pius X, but priests also outside the Society of St. Pius X came back to the Latin Mass, encouraged by the act of Archbishop Lefebvre and the consecration of these bishops, and seeing a hope for the future a hope for the future of our faith. But at the same time, the devil worked his battle plan. At the same time, he wished to make the devil wanted to make sure that tradition did not grow too much. He wanted to make sure that the true Catholic tradition of the last 2,000 years would not return as the united teaching of our Holy Church. Therefore, he created the Ecclesia Dei Commission, which purpose is to divide the Catholic faith, divide Catholic tradition. And as Father Giselle pointed in his sermon a week and a half ago, it was effective in that work. It did divide. The motu proprio of, of, of uh, John Paul II did divide Catholic tradition. It did keep people from coming into the fullness and correctness of Catholic tradition, where they could have at least their Latin mass, but they wouldn't have to have the faith. And so there became another level of Catholics, Catholics who are Latin mass goers, who believe in all the teachings of the church, Catholics who believe in many of the teachings of the church, Catholics who believe in some of the teachings of the church, Catholics who believe in almost none of the teachings of the church, but they all like Latin. And the devil used Latin mass as a, as a banner to tell the people of the world, you don't need the faith that comes of the mass, just come to the mass. And this was stated in the, in the, in, in the Ecclesia Dei document and also in Summorum Pontificum. In Summorum Pontificum 2007, Pope, Pope Benedict XVI repeats what was in the previous uh, uh, two, two documents. Ecclesia Dei included the end of 84 and expanded it. And, then, and, and in 2007, Pope, Pope Benedict replaced it in, in the end with a new expanded end And that this, this, this end he says that the, remember that the, the Latin Mass and the new Mass, they are the same Mass. They mutually enrich one another. That is what they do. It is like telling the wife that she and the, the mistress, who is not the wife, they mutually enrich each other and both should, be, both should be happy to live together with the husband. And this is a great abomination. The wife should never tolerate the mistress to live together with the husband. And in fact, it's a greater abomination than when the husband leaves the wife and stays with the mistress. But if he tries to have the mistress and the wife stay together, it is a greater abomination. And so it is in 2007, Pope Benedict created a greater abomination by telling us that the old mass and the new mass, one is the ordinary form of the same rite, and the other is the extraordinary form of the same rite. And they mutually enrich one another. And no one should, should accept the, the, that, that, that this Latin mass is being allowed to be celebrated more freely without also recognizing that the condition of, re of celebrating this Mass and attending this Mass more freely given in Sumorum Pontificum 2007, given only on the condition of the acceptance of the errors and heresies of Vatican II, and only on the condition of accepting the new Mass as a Mass of our Holy Church. And this is an abomination before God. This created a greater division in the Church. But many souls came. And as Father Giselle pointed out in a sermon a week, a week ago, it said that, in fact, there was a flip side to this motu proprio, the side that the popes didn't think of. John Paul II and Benedict XVI, they saw that this motu proprio would divide tradition. 
They saw that it would it would keep souls, many souls, from entering into true, true, fully, correctly Catholic parishes, and divide us. And it did, did did do that. However, there was a flip side, and that is souls would come to the Latin Mass for the first time from regular Novus Ordo parishes, not knowing anything about it. Then they would see that this Mass, the true Mass, does not match the Protestant Mass that they are attending. And that there is a different doctrine between the true Mass and the Protestant Mass. And therefore, they would begin to try to learn about that faith and not only attend the Latin Mass, but through the Latin Mass, come back to the true faith. As one priest told me a few years ago, I said, why don't you join the Society of St. Pius X in 2013? And he said, why would I join an organization that is trying to join the organization that I am trying to leave. Why on earth would I do that? <laughs> They're trying to come to the Nova Soto, I'm trying to leave the Nova Soto. So it's not on my list of places to go. That's what a priest told me in Australia a few years ago. And the fact is that so that this, so that what, what, what happened in this, this modo proprio of Samoan Pontificum, it said very clearly Latin Mass is only allowed if you accept Vatican II in the new Mass. And it me is considered as an expression, an extraordinary expression of the same right. Now we come forward to July 16th, 2021. And the whole conservative world, the whole so-called traditional world, the only, uh, the, the only good thing that Father says, the so-called traditional world, <laughs> the so-called traditional world is in a great upheaval. That's one of the things Father Pagliarani points out in his letter on this uh, moda proprio. That the so-called the traditional world is a great upheaval. And that it's an, a, a great upheaval because of this a significant event of July 16th, 2021. And in the moda proprio of a, of, a, of a week and a half ago, or less than that, eight, nine days ago, July the 16th, when, when this moda proprio was made by Pope Francis, it says in it that the, the, all the previous uh, re relaxations and special privileges given to anyone who celebrates the Latin Mass, they are all revoked and all abrogated by this decree. And that no, no new priest can celebrate the Latin Tridentine Mass without writing to Rome. If he was ordained July 16th or after 2021, he must write to Rome for permission to celebrate the Latin Mass and the bishop will forward a request to Rome, and he cannot say it until Rome says yes. Any priest who is already celebrating the Latin Tridentine Mass, these priests must write and ask for permission again to continue to celebrate that Mass. Furthermore, at the Masses that are being celebrated, the proclamation of the Epistle and Gospel, the readings, should be done in the vernacular. They now must be done in the vernacular. It was a request of, of Benedict XVI, he preferred that it be done in vernacular. In 2007, he says that. But now in 2021, it is now a demand that they be done in the vernacular. In 1984, the motu proprio said that there can be no masses in the parochial churches. But then Benedict XVI allowed masses in parochial churches. In fact, John Paul II also allowed it in, in, the, in Ecclesia Dei Adflicta, <coughs> after Ecclesia Dei Adflicta. And then now it's back to what it was in 84. No more masses in parochial churches, only in mission churches or in other venues. Also, Pope Francis says bishops are forbidden to establish any new Latin mass parishes. And they, so they, they, the ones that exist are frozen. And then the ones that do exist, he is to re-examine whether or not they should be retained. The bishop should re-examine them to see whether or not they should be retained, and therefore is encouraged to close as many as possible. So this is clearly the, the bringing to a conclusion of the work of Ecclesia Dei. What is the response of the Society of St. Pius X? <clears throat> the, the Superior General, the new Superior General, Father Davide Pagliarani, the new Italian superior of the Society of St. Pius X. The letter from the Superior General of the Priest of the Society of St. Pius X, in light of the publication of the Moda Proprio Traditionis Custodes, the jailers or guards of tradition. This Mass, our Mass, must really be for us, like the pearl of great price in the Gospel, for which we are ready to renounce everything, for which we are ready to sell everything. This mass must be likened to us a pearl of great, a pearl of great price. And this is in the heading. 
First thing to note, this mass must be for us. And this is a standard, subjectivist, liberal, modernist way of saying anything. Remember, go back 2,000 years, and Caiaphas the priest was very upset with Pilate because Pilate had put upon the cross Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. He did not mind that Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, was written on that cross. He said, rather, I want you to make an adjustment to that statement, said Caiaphas, the priest of the Old Testament. I want you to say, he said he was the king of the Jews. He called himself the king of the Jews. So that he called himself king of the Jews, no problem. This fool called himself king of the Jews. But do not say that he is the king of the Jews. So likewise, note this modernist, subjectivist, Masonic ancients of two words, for us. These are signs that these modern superiors of the SSPX, they are the descendants of Caiaphas. They are not the descendants of St. Peter and the Apostles in their teaching and in their spirit. This Mass, our Mass, our Mass, must really be for us like the pearl of great price. Caiaphas would have no objections to this statement. But Caiaphas had great objections to Jesus Christ. Let it be said that the Mass is for us the pearl of great price. No, he is to make a comparison. The pearl of great price, of course, is the Catholic Church. The pearl of great price is the Catholic faith, the kingdom of God. That's what the pearl of great price is. But Father Pagliarani uses an analogy by saying, well, pretend like it, that the Mass is our pearl of great price rather than the kingdom of God and the faith. And so the Mass pearl of great price, it must be a pearl of great price for us. There's another way of saying it in ordinary speech, which is, one man's junk is another man's treasure. So if you go to the new mass, it is not a pearl of great price, the Latin Tridentine mass. That's my junk. But if you go to the true mass, then that is the treasure. So that which is garbage to the Novus Ordo liberal, it is treasure to us. And it sounds so beautiful, but this is a very carefully crafted document to go through all of the wickedness in it is very difficult. Each word is carefully crafted and matches perfectly modernism. First of all, the first paragraph. Dear members and friends of the Priestly Society of St. Pius X, the motu proprio traditionis custodes and the letter that accompanied it have caused a profound upheaval in the so-called traditionalist movement there he says, it's the so-called traditionalist movement. We are the real traditionalists, which is what a Catholic is. It is not an upheaval for us. But it is an upheaval in the so-called traditional movement. And notice also, he is distancing himself from this movement. It has caused a great upheaval in the so-called traditional movement. We can point out, quite, quite logically, that the era of the hermeneutics of continuity with its equivocations, illusions, and impossible efforts, is radically overswept aside, oh, radically over, swept aside with a wave of the sleeve. Let me get the glasses down. So, the motu proprio wiped away the hermeneutics of continuity, wiped away its, its equivocations, its illusions, its impossible efforts with the wave of the sleeve. That, that this tells us that this era is over, is it? Now, in my grammar class, from a child, Miss Paula Haig, she read that if I wrote something like this, if she would not have given me an F. I would have had been taken outside, and they would pulled out a, a whip and beat me to death. <laughs> Why is this? Because he brought up in the beginning. We can point out quite logically the era of hermeneutics continuity with its equivocations, illusions, and impossible efforts. I learned in grammar school, if you bring up something, equivocations, illusions, impossible efforts, then you're required later on in your, your three-page document to mention an example of an equivocation, an example of an illusion, an example of an impossible efforts. Don't bring up a question or point out a point and don't, and then don't answer it. This is done by idiots. 
And it's also done by very wise men who want to give impressions and not answers and who want to deceive. And this is the case of the New Society of St. Pius X in its Masonic response to, to Sumorum Pontificum. The era of hermeneutics of continuity, that reminds us of Pope Benedict the 16th, with, with, hermeneutics, with its equivocations, illusions, and false references, radically overswept, over, swept aside with a wave of sleeve. These clear-cut measures, what clear-cut measures? do not directly affect the Society of St. Pius X. However, they must be an occasion for us to reflect deeply on the situation. So you see we have a house here, and the neighbor's house is on fire. It's an orphanage, actually. And the orphans are inside burning. I want to first warn all of you, this doesn't affect us. We are not affected. Later on, he will say, we must let the people in the orphanage know that orphans are still going to be taken care of because some of you are orphans and we're going to take care of you. Let them know that. Send an uh, email into the burning building and let them know that. It doesn't affect us. This is an occasion to deeply reflect. That's what it is. It's an occasion to go into the burning building and pull out the dying children. It's an occasion to save those that are being burnt to death. It's an occasion to help them get out of the burning building so that they might live. But what does Father Pagliarani say? Showing the Masonic background and modernism, these clear-cut measures, doesn't say what they are, they must be the measures of the motu proprio, do not directly affect the Society of St. Pius X. However, they must be an occasion for us to reflect deeply on the situation. To do so, it is necessary to step back and ask ourselves a question that is both old and new. Why is the Tridentine Mass still the apple of discord after 50 years? There is a discord. There is a battle going on. It's been going on for 50 years. 50 years ago, 1970, so 51 years ago, 50 years ago, there came a new mass promulgated in the first Sunday of Advent, 1969, but often called the 1970 Missal. And that, that, that this 1970 Missal, there was a new mass, and there was a battle between the new mass and the old mass. There's a discord that goes back 50 years. Criminals do this in order to distract from the real problem. Does this crisis go back 50 years? No. It goes back 6,000 years to the, uh, to the, to the, to the serpent and, and, in the garden. But in this present crisis, it goes back to the heresies and errors presented to the whole world in Vatican II 60 years ago. 50 years ago came the new Mass. Now he's going to turn this into a battle about the Mass. Now for the last 50 years, the Society of St. Pius X and, tr and true traditional priests throughout the world have always said it is not a battle about the mass, it is a battle about the faith. Before 1969, there was no new mass, but there were plenty of new heresies. There are plenty of heretics. There are plenty of schismatics. There are plenty of souls burning in hell with their Latin Tridentine mass. Look at the prime example of the Orthodox in the East. Over a thousand years ago, some of them broke away from Christ and the true church. We give the date 1054 when they broke away. Some broke away before that, some broke away after that. And so for a thousand years, they broke away from the church. A thousand years, they have been cut off from us. Go inside their churches and see if there's a difference in their sacred liturgy and their mass and ours. Their mass is identical to ours. Their Eastern Mass is identical to our Eastern Mass. Their churches are like our churches. Their icons are like icons. Just a few little minor differences, such as you might see St. Photius. The only problem with St. Photius is that he's in hell. That's the only downside. But St. Photius might be there alongside the St. Ambrose. And St. Photius, who was a beautiful icon of St. Photius, he was the key wicked bishop who brought about the schism and denied that the Holy Ghost, <coughs> the Father and the Son, proceeds from the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father and the Son. 
He was the, one of the greatest leaders of the division in the church. And he is called St. Photius by the enemies of God. But you'll find a thousand-year-old painting of him. And they made other saints as well, belonging to a false church, painted in the traditional style. And they have incense, and they have the same mass we have. Did the Holy Fathers of the last 1,000 years say, let us not have conflict, us Orthodox and Catholics, because we have the same Mass. Your Mass is the same as ours. Your vestments are the same as ours. In fact, they're more traditional. They still kept all their beards. Many of our Eastern priests slowly showed off their beards. They kept, they kept some of the, 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 the details of the tradition better than our Catholics did. They became too Romanized. But essentially, it's the same exact liturgy. Is it about a liturgy? Absolutely not. But right at the very beginning, brought to our minds, is that this is a battle of the, that somehow the Mass is an apple of discord, and the battle is about the Mass. Now, why is this done? To placate the maximum number of people. It's very similar to the politician, wise politician, the United States, 1918. A lady asked him, what do you think about alcohol and prohibition and he didn't know if she was in favor of prohibition or she was against it and he said if you mean by alcohol that drink that destroys families that makes drunkards that takes money and throws away from families I am 100 percent against it but if you mean by alcohol that drink that the scripture says gives joy to the heart of man that is most beautiful to be had when men are having profound conversations and it is a spice of life. I am 100% in favor of it and that is my position and I will not budge. <laughs> Very wise man. <laughs> or like unto the priest who in the year 313 AD, 312 AD, told Maxentius, the Roman general, who was fighting Constantine, the Roman general, the night before the Battle of Milvian Bridge, Maxentius asked him, what's going to happen tomorrow? I assure you, Maxentius, you have nothing to fear, for the enemy of Rome will fall, will lose tomorrow. And he was comforted. The next day, Maxentius was dead. And the next day, he was wiped out. And his army was wiped out because of the miraculous victory of Constantine the Great. And Constantine came with a sword to kill the pagan priest. And the priest said, you can't kill me. He said, why not? Because I told Maxentius to his face yesterday. I told him right to his face. The enemy of Rome will fall. And he did. And so Constantine couldn't kill him. He said a statement which has two meanings. And this double meaning communication of charlatans and this, this double meaning communication as ambiguous communication is the hallmark of the enemies of God. Our Lord Jesus Christ said in the gospel, let your yes be yes and let your no be no. It is not a battle of the last 50 years. It is a battle of the faith and specifically a battle of modernism a battle of, and on, on the human side and Masonic infiltration of the church, but it's a battle of modernism and the heresies of Vatican II and the new mass we are opposed to because it is the expression of the errors and heresies of Vatican II. But he continues. Let's reflect deeply. First of all, we must remember, says Father Pagliarani, the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass is the continuation in time of the most bitter struggle that has ever existed, the battle between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. This combat culminated at Calvary. This is an example of the confusion, the deliberate confused language. Seventy years ago, I mean 50 years, 30 years ago, Archie Lefebvre pointed out the new Mass, the true Mass, is first of all the sacrifice of Calvary. The true mass equals the sacrifice. The unbloody sacrifice, the renewal of the sacrifice of Calvary, it is the same as the sacrifice of Calvary. But what does Father Pagliarini say? The holy sacrifice of the mass is the continuation of the battle that culminated in Calvary. So it's more than Calvary. Remember one time I was to a modernist priest for over three hours. I thought he believed in the real presence. 
I thought he believed Jesus Christ is really in the blessed sacrament. I thought he believed Mass was a sacrifice. But then he began to say things. Well, it's more than that. It's more than a real presence. It's more than a sacrifice. It's so much more than that. I don't believe Jesus is physically in the, in the host. I don't believe it's just a sacrifice of death. It's, it is, but it's more than that. And this is modernist speak. The holy sacrifice of the Mass is the sacrifice of Calvary. That's what it is. And here he says many things about it in this letter, but not that. It is a battle, an ongoing battle. We battle at baptism, the devil. We battle in all seven sacraments, the devil. We battle when we say the rosary, the devil. We battle when we do good actions, the devil. But all these battles are not the Mass. The Mass is the center. The Mass is the heart. But all these battles are not the Mass. And this, this, this vague speak is not accidental. It was for this struggle and it was for this victory that he became incarnate. It's not his victory through the cross and the precious blood. It is understandable that the perpetuation, its perpetuation will be marked by conflicts and contradictions. So since the mass is a contradiction, the sacrifice of the cross is a contradiction, it's understandable that there will also be contradictions. It is not surprising that the mass, which perfectly expresses our Lord's definitive victory, over sin through his atoning sacrifice is itself a sign of contradiction. But why has the Mass become a sign of contradiction within the church itself? And here is an example of this. This is the third paragraph of a purely modernist paragraph The St. Pius X would have Father Padre brought in to answer for this paragraph. But why has the Mass become a sign of contradiction within the church itself? The answer is simple and increasingly clear. It's simple and increasingly clear. Well, if it's simple, it should already be clear. Now, the answer is simple and increasingly clear. After 50 years, the various elements that confirm the answer have become obvious to all well-informed Catholics. Would you like breakfast? It's increasingly clear. It's simple. It's obvious. All well-informed people should understand what it is that I, that I am about to desire. Do you want coffee or tea? <laughs> it's simple. It's increasingly clear. All people should be well informed. Don't you understand? <laughs> How about yes or no? How about let your yes be yes and let your no be no? And this is not going to be the case with Father Pagliarani. Here we notice the modernism that is condemned by St. Pius X and Prescendi. The Tridentine Mass, after well informed Catholics. The Tridentine Mass expresses and conveys a conception of Christian life. The Mass conveys a conception of Christian life. I don't know if you've been to Mass recently, but it is a Mass about the conveying a conception of Christian life. That's Karl Rahner speak. That is uh, on the Lubach speak. That is modernist speak. The Mass is a conception of the Christian life. A lady told me that in the Philippines, a sister told me that words in the Philippines a few years ago. After she told me, she did not believe in the physical presence of Christ because where two or three are gathered together, we're all together. But she began with this. The Mass expresses and conveys a conception of Christian life and consequently a conception of the Catholic Church. That's modernism. St. Pius X points out in Pascendi, the modernists believe that first comes the believer who lives his Christian life and then he vomits forth. He vomits forth a community. He vomits forth a community which is called an ecclesia, a church. And the church comes from the Christian life. This is heresy. What do you learn in the catechism? Who founded the Catholic Church? Not Christians and not Christian life. Jesus Christ, God the Son who became man, founded the Catholic Church 2,000 years ago. The Catholic Church does not come from Christian life. Christian life is lived by those who are members of the Church. This is modernist speak par excellence, extremely evil. 
The Tridentine Mass expresses and conveys a conception of Christian life and consequently a conception of the Catholic Church that is absolutely incompatible with the ecclesiology that emerged from the Second Vatican Council. Note, emerged. It is not incompatible with the ecclesiology of the Council, which indicate that, it's, that they're opposed to one another. No, it's opposed to the ecclesiology that emerged from the Council. You first say things that don't sound wonderful, but then they may turn into lies, which means they're not lies. You say things, they move in a dangerous direction, but it's not yet dangerous. Here he says very carefully in this, that's why July 22nd was when this document was, was, was put out. July 16th was the day of the uh, motu proprio. Uh, that is absolutely incompatible. The conception of the Christian life, the conception of the Catholic Church, absolutely incompatible with the ecclesiology that emerged from the Second Vatican Council. The ecclesiology of the Second Vatican Council is heretical. The ecclesiology of the Second Vatican Council is not compatible with the Catholic faith. But here we're talking about the ecclesiology of the Mass that emerged from the Second Vatican Council. The problem, now we bring up again in my English class from Ms. Paula Haig. The problem, all right? You bring up the problem. What is the problem? Well, let's say what the problem is. The problem is not simply liturgical, aesthetic, or purely technical. The problem is not liturgical. The problem is not aesthetic. The problem is not technical. The problem is, are you ready? Simultaneously doctrinal. The problem is doctrinal. Sim the problem is moral. The problem is spiritual. The problem is ecclesiological. And the problem is lit liturgical. In a, pri in a nutshell, what's the problem? By the time he gets to this end of the sentence, you're going to, I don't know what the heck he's talking about. <laughs> and I don't know what the problem is. <laughs> and that's deliberate. In a nutshell, it is a problem that affects all aspects of the church's life without exception. It is a question of faith. This is a problem that affects all the aspects of the church's life. It's a question of faith. So what's the problem? This is a document about a motu proprio. Is there a problem with it? And this is a document about what's happening in the church today. We say we're a battle about the masses. And he says he brings up key words which are supposed to shut down your defenses. You hear the word faith. Oh, he said faith. It must be good. You hear incompatible, new mass, old mass. Oh, that, that's got to be good. Well, that's incompatible. You hear struggle, combat. Oh, that's got to be good. This is deliberate deceiving document and also, so, and so, and it, so what is the problem and we continue on the one side there's a mass of all times on the other side is a mass of Paul the sixth now once again what's the mass one side is a mass of all times it is a standard of a church that defies the world so the mass is a standard of the church that defies the world the mass is a sacrifice Look it up in your catechism. The Mass, in the Mass, is a sacrament and a sacrifice. It is a sacrifice of Calvary, and it is a sacrament which is the true body in which the true body, blood, and soul and divinity of Jesus Christ enters into a host by the act of tran miracle of transubstantiation. And only the priest can offer the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Later on, he will say, typical modernist speak, straight from Karl Rahner, that the Christ shares his cross in the Mass. He shares his cross. That's coming up. Be patient. Mm. And on, on one side is a mass of all times. It is a standard of a church that defies the world and is certain of victory. It is a battle. It, for it is a battle is nothing less than the continuation of the battle of our Lord. Bless the Lord, wage or destroy sin or destroy the kingdom of Satan. It is the mass. It is by the mass and through the mass that our Lord enlists Catholic souls into his ranks. So the Mass enlists souls into his ranks. I learned in my catechism that you get enlisted in the ranks of Jesus Christ by being baptized. That's what I learned. You must be baptized to enter into the ranks. But he avoids heresy by saying it enlists the souls. In other words, it's like the army recruiter gets you to join the army, and then you actually sign the paper and join the army. So, he, so that the, the Lord enlists the... the, the our Lord enlists Catholic souls into his ranks.
by sharing with them both his cross and his victory. The mass sharing his cross and sharing his victory. Archie Lefebvre pointed out, one of the great evils of Vatican II is it keeps putting the word we in there. We believe in God. And that one of the evil ceremonies of the new mass is that the priest, what does he do? He consecrates the host. This is my body. He then elevates it immediately. And then afterwards he genuflects. And this matches Lutheran theology. For they believe that the people make Christ present with the priest. And therefore the priest should not genuflect and adore Christ until after the people have confirmed his presence. Whereas in the Catholic Mass, the, the, the priest does not kneel down once until the consecration. He says, Hoc est enum carpus meum, this is my body, and immediately he genuflects. A thousand years later, somebody came up with the idea of elevating the host in the air because of the heresy of Berengarius. But for the first thousand years, there was no elevation of the host. How did the server know? How did the people know that Christ is present? They saw the priest genuflect. They saw him adore, and they knew that Christ was there because the priest made him present, and the priest is adoring. What does it mean to share the cross? This is an example of ambiguity that we find because maybe we share the cross by getting the fruits of the cross. Okay, that's not a heresy. But do we share the cross by being crucified with Christ at the moment of the Mass so that we make him present with the priest? That's heresy. And so we're going to have statements which can have multiple meanings. Like the, like the wise politician who was on both sides of the prohibition battle. And so it is that it is by the Mass that the, the, the Lord enlists Catholic souls into his ranks by sharing with them both his cross and his victory. From all this fundamentally militant conception of Christian life, it flows, follows a fundamentally militant conception of Christian life that is characterized by two elements, a spirit of sacrifice and an unwavering supernatural hope. Hope is always one of the important words used by modernists. Hope. They use this word because modernists are going to be in hell. Hope is a very important word for people in hell. They don't have any. They are in total despair. And as you will find that many souls that are on that path to lies and on that path to hell, when they are deceiving others, they often bring up hope. Hope is a holy and supernatural virtue, part of the three theological virtues, that becomes with faith and it produces charity. But they speak of hope without faith and they speak of hope without charity. And this is demonic. On the other side stands the mass of Paul VI. That's the new mass which is an authentic expression of a church that wants to live in harmony with the world and lends an ear to her demands. So that the new mass is an expression of a church that wants to live in harmony with the world. When Cardinals of Salviani and Bacci commented concerning the new mass, they didn't say that. They spoke about the mass as a sacrifice, a true propitiatory sacrifice, and the new mass is not clearly a propitiatory sacrifice it, can, it may be only a sacrifice of praise, a sacrificium laudis, in which case it would, be, it would not even be a mass. And this is a very grave departure. Is it a sacrifice propitiatory or a sacrifice of praise? But here, what does Father Pagliarotti say about it? That the new mass, it is about listening to the world. The mass is about listening to the world. It's true that Vatican II listens to the world. It produced that new mass. But the new mass is, 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 is not accurate to say the essence of the problem of the new mass is that it wants to be in harmony with the, with the world. It represents a church that in the final analysis no longer needs to fight against the world. This is all done to placate the consciences of good people. Wait. Now, here is a church that no longer has anything to teach the world because it listens to the powers of the world. It is a church that no longer needs sacrifice of our blessed Lord because having lost the notion of sin, it no longer has anything for which to atone. Here is a church that no longer has a mission of restoring the universal kingship of Christ. Because this modernist church, because it wants to make its contribution to creation of this earth of a better world that is freer, more egalitarian, and more eco-responsible. And all this with purely human means. They're not human means, they're demonic means. No mention of Satan. It is Satan that is in this new mass. And it is an expression of a faith that is damaging souls. 
The new Mass has been out now for 50 years. During these 50 years, hundreds of millions of Catholics have walked away from the church. Hundreds of millions of Catholics have lost their souls. They have turned away from God. This isn't because of human means. It's because of demonic means and a demonic maze. This is a humanist mission of the, of the church, matched by a humanist liturgy, and empty of the notion of the sacredness. This battle has been waged for the past 50 years, which has just been highly, which has just seen a highly significant event on July the 16th. That's the motu proprio. It is not simply a war between two rights. It is indeed a war between two different and opposing conceptions of the Catholic Church and Christian life. It's a war between two conceptions. Modernists speak. What are conceptions? Many possibilities for conceptions. It's a war between two religions. A war between two faiths. A war between God and Satan. But two conceptions? That can mean anything. It is a war between two conceptions, because maybe the Dominicans have one conception and the Franciscans have another. And both conceptions are within the confines of Catholic belief. It does not mean that they are incompatible or that they are incompatible with Catholic teaching. The deliberate using of vague terms that can have multiple meanings. Since Almighty God, the church, the conception is absolutely incompatible with the church. And paraphrasing St. Augustine, one could say that the two masses have built two cities. The mass of all times has built a Christian city. The new mass seeks to build a humanist and secular city. Notice that the, new, the old mass built a Christian city. But the new mass seeks to build, maybe it doesn't build it. The new mass, the old mass builds a Christian city. The new mass seeks to build a humanist city. And here we're staying away from what the essence of the mass is, the sacrifice of Calvary. Since Almighty God has allowed this, it is certainly for the greater good. Firstly, for ourselves. So God has allowed this motu proprio, firstly for ourselves, who have the undeserved good fortune of knowing the Tridentine Mass and who can benefit from it. Always going to make something subjective here. Who can benefit from it? We, we can benefit from the Latin Mass. Everyone can benefit from the Latin Mass, not just us. Always throwing in a subjective element whenever you're speaking about the Mass. Firstly, for ourselves, who have the undeserved good fortune of knowing the Tridentine Mass and who can benefit from it. We possess a treasure with a value we do not always appreciate and which we perhaps preserve too much out of simple habit. When something precious is attacked or scorned, we begin to appreciate better its true value. And may this shock, provoked by the harshness of the official text of July 16th, now, this document is supposed to be about the official text of July 16th. He doesn't talk about anything in those texts. And is the harshness, sometimes a father is too harsh with his son. But is it evil? Not always. Is it legitimate? Is it illegitimate? You can be too harsh, but it's okay. If your son takes candy out of, out of, the, out of the, the, the cookie out of the cookie jar and you ground it for two months, that's very harsh. If you take a cookie jar and then you skin him alive and eat him, that's also very harsh. But the one is called murder, and the other one is a slightly too strict punishment. They're not exactly the same thing, murder and a too strict punishment. Is this motu proprio just a harsh motu proprio that we have to accept? Because superiors are often harsh. Or is it harsh in such a way that we must reject it because it's against God? A superior can be harsh and a subject must accept it. Only when this harshness goes against the law of God must it be rejected. So the great question that the world is looking to Father Pagliarani, the superior of the size of the 10th, what should I do? I'm a priest of the Novus Ordo. I'm saying the, the Latin Mass. What should I do? They're telling me I've got to write to my superiors. Don't write to them. They're telling me I've got to stop saying it. Don't stop saying it. Keep saying it. But they might throw me out. Don't worry. If they throw you out, you continue to say Mass in the parish hall. If they throw you out, you say it in someone's house. And you take the faithful with you. Don't abandon your sheep. Like Father Giselle said in a sermon a week and a half ago. Don't abandon the sheep. Stay with your sheep. Protect your sheep. That's what we're supposed to be telling them. And only say the Latin Mass. Drop the new Mass. They don't, they're not, the Pope Francis is right about that. They shouldn't go together. But here, what does Father Pagliarani say? We are shocked by the harshness of the official text of July 16th. This harshness, 
should serve to renew, deepen, and rediscover our detachment to the Tridentine Mass. Whenever you hear deepen and rediscover, that's modernist, 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 modernist. Let's deepen and rediscover our love of the traditional Mass. Aren't you so grateful that we have fire extinguishers? Aren't you so grateful that our house didn't catch on fire? Don't you feel sorry for those kids dying and burning over there? I, know, I do. I, I feel awful. I think we should deeply consider this situation and be so grateful that we are not affected. And later on, don't forget about the advice, we must let them know that orphanages will still continue. While you're dying and burning your orphanage there, before you die, know that we still got an orphanage open and tell your donors to send a check to us. This is a mockery of truth. It's a mockery of the duty of the priesthood. It's a mockery of the work of Archbishop Lefebvre and the Zion St. Pius X. That we are deeply affected. So then, a, so then, since Almighty God, firstly for we ourselves, by the hearts of the serve to renew, deepen, and rediscover our attachments right to Mass. This Mass, our Mass, always go to the subjective. This Mass, our Mass, must really be for us. Here it was drawn out in the, in the thought, like the pearl of great price in the gospel, for which we are ready to renounce everything, for which we are ready to sell everything. He who is not prepared to shed his blood for this Mass is not worthy to celebrate it. He who is not prepared to give up everything to protect it is not worthy to attend it. This is the traditionalist candy section. You're supposed to be really motivated when you hear that. Supposed to be really happy. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> Let us consider our mass, which may be garbage to others, but to us, it's the pearl of great price. It is like the pearl of great price in the gospel, for which we are ready to renounce everything, for which we are ready to sell everything. He who is not prepared to shed his blood for this mass is not worthy to celebrate it, and he who is not prepared to give up everything to protect it is not worthy to attend it. That matches. Article 3, paragraph 4 of the motu proprio of Pope Francis, in which he says, there should be a priest in charge of the Latin masses, but this priest must have a great zeal for souls. This priest must have a great knowledge of Latin. He must know the liturgy. He must understand it well. And if he doesn't, and, if, and he must be very pastoral and understand ecclesial communion, that's the kind of priest we want to celebrate the Latin Mass. And if you don't fit those categories, you're not worthy of celebrating the Latin Mass. I'm sorry, Father. I know you said you like Latin Mass, but your Latin pronunciation ain't quite up to stuff. <laughs> and you only studied Latin for one year. I want to see someone with a Ph.D. in Latin. I, I, that's how important it is to me. It's so important. You have to have a Ph.D. in Latin. You have to show your pastoral care. You've got a bad attitude. You have to show your love of ecclesial communion. I want to have priests celebrating the Latin Mass, says the modernist bishop. Of course I do. But the Pope told me you shouldn't be allowed to celebrate it unless you're, you are all about that Mass, unless you really know Latin. And you don't, Father, so you can't say it. Sorry. Now, who is worthy of the Mass? There isn't one human being on earth other than Jesus Christ, the true man. Who is worthy of the Mass? Do we, are we, what do we say every time we go to celebrate the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass? We begin it by saying we are not worthy. By saying the Confidior. We repeat it in the Offertory. Oh Lord, forgive me for my innumerable sins. That's what we say in every single Mass. Innumerable. My innumerable sins. In every Mass, the priest expresses his unworthiness. And here the righteous Father Pagliarani is going to say, you're not worthy to celebrate the Mass because you're not ready to die for it. How do you know if you're ready to die for it? You only know if they come with a gun. But we certainly know that we're not worthy of it. And no one is. And so but he says, he who is not prepared to shed his blood for this Mass is not worthy to celebrate it. And don't forget, he who is not prepared to give up everything to protect it is not worthy to attend it. You're not worthy to attend the Mass if you're not worthy to give up everything to protect it. I feel sorry for those people. They, they, they are dying in that orphanage over there. But they should have uh, paid attention. They should be putting out the fire themselves. 
And so this is very grave and very wicked. And then, next paragraph. This should be our first reaction to these events that have just shaken the Catholic Church. What should be our first reaction? He said about 20 different under, uh, incomprehensible things. Our reaction as Catholic priests and as Catholic laity must be a profound and more far-reaching than all those feeble and sometimes hopeless commentaries. We have to have a reaction more profound than these hopeless commentaries, such as the one made by Father Bobby Ironic. This is absurd. And then our blessed Lord certainly has another objective in mind in allowing this new attack on the Tridentine Mass. No one can doubt that in recent years many priests and faithful have discovered the Mass. Everyone, many people discover the Mass. And that through it they have encountered a new spiritual and moral horizon. You know, that's why you go to the Latin Mass, to encounter a new spiritual and moral horizon. Caitlyn Jenner discovered that when he made a shift. The Satanists discovered that when they went through the first human sacrifice. They found a new spiritual and moral horizon. When you leave the Catholic Church and become a, a charismatic, you find a new spiritual and moral horizon. And this is what he says. A Catholic priest ordained in the Society of St. Pius X, our new superior. Is this the speech of St. Thomas Aquinas? Absolutely not. Is it the speech of the Gospel? Absolutely not. This is demonic modernist Masonic speak. And if it looks like, look, walks like a duck and talks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's a duck. And this is very grave and very evil. And supposed to placate souls. They have encountered a new spiritual and moral horizon which has opened the door to the sanctification of their souls. If you study theology, you understand the Mass and the Holy Spirit, the seven sacraments create grace up ex opere operato. They are directly sanctify your souls. But here he says it opens the door to sanctify the souls. The latest measures taken against the Mass will force these souls to draw all the consequences. And sorry, I'm a bit long here, but we must go through this. <clears throat> the latest measures, this is the, this is the conclusion. Pay very close attention. The latest measures taken against the Mass will force those souls, those souls affected by it, the people in that orphanage dying over there, it will force those souls, <clears throat> the latest measures against the Mass will force these souls to draw all the consequences of what they have discovered. They must now choose, with all the elements of discernment that are at their disposal, what is necessary for every well-informed Catholic conscience. They must choose what's necessary for a well-informed Catholic conscience. What does that mean? Those souls that are well-informed. The Mass and the true faith is necessary for all souls, whether they're well-informed or not. When the saints go into a place where there is not the faith, they find everyone in that place needs the faith, not just the well-informed, not just the educated, but every single individual needs a faith. And all are affected by this evil act of Pope Francis, implementing the evil act of Pope Benedict, and the evil act of Pope John Paul II. That's all he's doing. And the evil acts coming from Vatican II. That's all this motopopery is. The, in the implementation of the lies and errors and heresies of Vatican II in practice. That's all it is. It affects all souls, not just those souls. Many souls will find themselves faith with an important choice. Choice, 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 moral horizon. This is modernist speak. That will affect their faith. They're going to have a choice that's going to affect their faith. Because, and let us say once more, the Holy Sacrifice of Mass is the supreme expression of a doctrinal and a moral universe. That's the first time he said that, by the way. But we'll say it once more. <laughs> Another grammar problem. Let us say once more, the Mass is the supreme expression of a doctrinal and moral universe. That's what Hollywood is. It's the supreme expression of a doctrinal and moral universe. That's what Universal Studios is. It just isn't the doctrinal and moral universe of God. It isn't the right one. It's a satanic one. Why are you saying this garbage? It is a supreme, it is an important choice. The Mass is the supreme expression of a doctrinal and moral universe. It is therefore a question of choosing the Catholic faith in its entirety. And through it, choosing our Lord Jesus Christ 
with his cross. See, when you're a Catholic, you have the faith in its entirety, and you go to heaven with that. If you're not Catholic, whatever you have of the faith makes you go to heaven. Again, a speak that matches Karl Rahner, that matches the modernist of Vatican II, to say something which is, allows itself to the truth being in other religions, not only in our religion, in other masses, not only in our mass. It is therefore a question of choosing the Catholic faith in its entirety, and through it, our Lord choosing our Lord Jesus Christ, and with his cross, his sacrifice, the universal kingship, it is a matter of choosing his precious blood, of imitating the crucified one, and following him to the end by a complete and rigorous and coherent fidelity. Whenever you're relying on being unfaithful, always talk about fidelity. <laughs> always throw that word in. And then the last two, par last two paragraphs. What are we supposed to do? The Society of St. Pius X, says the Superior General, Father Pagliarani, has the duty to assist all those souls. Here I agree with him. We have the duty to assist all those souls in that burning house of the Novus Ordo Ecclesia Dei, former Ecclesia Dei communities. Those souls suffering there, let them call us. We'll try to bring them to Mass. We'll bring them to Confession. Let them send priests to us. We'll try to help them to be strong and stay in that Mass and come to the true Catholic tradition. And we want to help them. Those who want the Mass, call us. Contact, uh, contact my number, 303-549-3047. Give me a call. And we will try our best to be able to answer the call and take care of the souls and give them the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, whose Mass is being taken away from them. The true Mass is being taken away from them. Even though it's in a setting that's not good, the most appropriate setting, this true Mass is still the true Mass, and they need the true Mass and the faith that comes with it. And it's being ripped away from them by wicked bishops and a wicked pope following the wicked council of Vatican II. But what's the duty of St. Pius X society? The society of St. Pius X has the duty to assist all those souls who are currently in dismay and are confused. Okay, how are we going to help them? Firstly, we have the duty to offer them the certitude that the mass can never disappear from the face of the earth. That's a sign of hope. That's through, This is the passage. I'm going to offer you help. Your orphanage is burning down. Your mass is being taken away. You are abandoned in the wilderness, and you're not going to have the mass in the true faith. But don't worry, I've still got it. Aren't you comforted? And don't, don't worry, I'm still going to be able to go to Mass. I can still live. I've still got what I need. Shouldn't that give you hope? Just like nowadays, in one of the most wicked acts of modern medicine, does it give hope to a modern patient who's lying on the deathbed, being treated by hospice, and being starved to death, and being not given liquid, and dying a most excruciating death, of starvation and thirst. And while that patient is lying there dying of thirst, one of the most painful deaths you can have, people are standing with Cokes and Pepsis and water inside the hospital room, drinking and eating. Isn't that a sign of hope? That that patient is dying a most cruel, most excruciating death of starvation. But at least he has the comfort of knowing there is food everywhere. He's just not getting it. Isn't that hopeful? This is satanic hope. This is satanic. This is Masonic, and this is modernist. Souls who have the Latin Mass out in the middle of nowhere, Alaska, in the middle of nowhere, of South America, nowhere, United States, being taken from them. Don't be encouraged, because we still got our Mass. Your parish closed down, but mine didn't. Your bishop shut it down, but mine didn't. This is a sign of hope. We want to give you the certitude that the Mass is going to continue, just not for you. Very hopeful. This is an absolutely necessary sign. We must offer. We have the duty to offer them, says Father Pagliarani, we have the duty to offer them the certitude that the Tridentine Mass can never disappear from the face of the earth. This is an absolutely necessary sign of hope. Moreover, each of us, whether priests or faithful, must extend a warm helping hand to them. For he who has no desire to share the riches he enjoys, in all truth, unwor is unworthy of possessing them. How are we going to do that? Only in this way will we truly love souls. Show our love for the church, for every soul that we win to our blessed Lord's cross, and to the immense love that he manifested through his sacrifice, will be a soul truly won to his church, and to the charity that animates his church, which must be ours, especially at this present time. And then we pray to Our Lady of Sorrows, 
and put everything in her hands. So this is a Masonic document. Doesn't give answers. Supposed to make those people who are already the constituency feel good. Make us feel and believe the battle is a battle of the mass when it's a battle of the faith. Make us think that there are harshness coming from Pope Francis, but it's not just the implementation of Vatican II and modernism. And so we're supposed to feel good and be comforted because we've still got something and they don't. And a communication of the faith in this document of Father Bagliarani, which is a modernist faith, and not a Catholic faith. His yes is not yes. His no is not no. He even communicates exactly St. Pius X said in Bashendi that there is a conception of Christian life which leads, therefore, consequently, to the Catholic faith, which is exactly what modernists teach is the history of our church. They say it began with Christians who felt one way. They gathered a community and they formed a church. Whereas we know the church is founded by Jesus Christ and not by the community. And so there is hidden modernism in there and also the subjectivism. And this is a very grave and wicked attack against the faith. And it, and, and it needs to be and must be condemned. As regards the motu proprio itself, let the priests and the Novo Sordo, who are celebrating the new mass and the old mass, let them give up the new mass. Let them stay firm with the old mass. When Pope Francis says this new mass, the old mass can only be had insofar as it leads us to the new. Well, the old mass doesn't lead us to the new. Therefore, dump the new. Stay forward firmly only with the old mass. Stay faithful to the old mass. Dump the new mass. Have nothing to do with the modernism. The faithful will take care of you. And the God will take care of you. No one who stands for the truth will be abandoned. And don't worry about being excommunicated. St. Anthony, Anthony's was excommunicated three times. Don't worry about being kicked out of the diocese. It happened to many saints kicked out of their own dioceses. Don't worry about being executed or being put to death. Stand firm for the faith. The faith will take care of you. God will make sure that you're not abandoned and that, we, and that it's going to be a new branch of traditionalists that are going to come. A new branch. The old ones have forgotten about Christ. So there will be new souls that come who never knew about the Latin Mass but only learned about it from a more appropriate Mass. I have faith like to talk to someone in the store just a couple days ago that I, like, I go to the new Mass with my, my many children and um, but I, I wanted to go to the Latin Mass. I think it's really nice, but I prefer it. But I haven't got it yet. But then I saw the motu proprio of Pope Francis, and I realized, you know what? Maybe it's more than just two different liturgies have the same thoughts, the same faith. Maybe there's a different faith in that new liturgy, and there is a different faith. I'm gonna have to look into this more and see if maybe the Latin Mass is the right way to go, and it is the right way to go. And there will be souls to look into it more. And like, like Father Chazelle said in his sermon, he said, Pope Francis, good luck. You let the worms out of the can. Now the worms are all going over the place. People have now been exposed to the mass, which is bringing them in the direction of the truth. They're going towards the truth. And you want to put all the worms back in the can. Good luck. You're not going to be able to put all the worms back in the can. God wins this war, not Satan. And that this victory is coming soon by the victory of Mary. And it's not going to, it's coming soon by the victory of Mary. Her victory is coming in a sudden way, in short order, in due time, the time she chooses. But they stay firm in the faith, stay, uh, reject Traditionis Custodes and all the other motu proprios, including Sumorum Pontificum, and stand firm for the holy, true faith and the quo primum given to us by St. Pius V and the mass given to us by Lord Jesus Christ handed down from the apostles and that we don't need to leave, that we don't need permission to celebrate this mass and this mass is the center of the faith and as if without the faith it's impossible to please God. Stay firm in the fight for the faith and preserve the mass with the faith. Without the faith, the mass will not help us. With the faith, it is unstoppable. Closing, I bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.